every investigation of the Christian tradition, sooner or later, has to face the fact that at the centre of this faith is belief in resurrection. It's there at the beginning and the end, for it's central to its conception and consummation. But what we are to make of this predominant theme is not so straightforward. For how this belief at the core of Christian origins is to be interpreted is as controversial today as it's ever been. Any understanding or assessment of this theme will of course have to investigate its roots. Roots that can be traced back into the Hebrew scriptures to the hopes and expectations of Second Temple Judaism. And what is most illuminating is how this hope has been developed and at times transformed within emergent Christianity. This development has been explored thoroughly in a recent study by the New Testament scholar Tom Wright. When I started writing this book, I didn't know any of this. I hadn't thought about it at all. But I wanted to do a thing on the pagan and Jewish backgrounds. And there it is. Judaism has one segment which believes in resurrection, the Pharisees and the people who cluster around that belief. Christianity belongs at that point on the spectrum, but then it develops it in several different ways. One is that in the Pharisaic writings and, say, in even the Maccabean literature, resurrection is important but not that important. Whereas in early Christianity, it is central and absolutely vital. Um, it's, it's very interesting, this, that if you look at the Gospels, you'll discover that resurrection is hardly mentioned in the Gospels outside the actual resurrection accounts at the end. And to that extent, they're much more like Second Temple Jewish literature. Resurrection is there, but it's not a big theme. But in early Christianity, from Paul onwards, it's huge. It's enormous. So that's the first thing. The second thing... Um, is that resurrection has split into two and it's instead of it being everybody at the end of time it's Jesus first and other people later and the third thing particularly it's is that it's a transformed physicality and that is unprecedented it's not a resuscitation people often say dismissively oh resurrection isn't about the resuscitation but resuscitation of a corpse it's it's a it's a spiritual idea and um, as Steve Davis an American philosopher of religion says I actually don't know anyone who's argued the resurrection was the resuscitation of a corpse but skeptics like to wave that around in order then to say those are the only two alternatives and it's clear in the New Testament that this is a major new feature that it's a body, but it's a transformed body. Th those, are the, those are the real central things. Now Tom Wright is not just interested in studying early Christian and Jewish beliefs concerning the resurrection. He is crucially putting forward a thorough critique of a popular scholarly hypothesis concerning the resurrection accounts. This hypothesis suggests that there has been a fundamental development within the New Testament. From the original experience of the disciples, consisting basically of subjective visions, that were then, later in the first century, literally fleshed out and developed into objective encounters with the risen Christ in the Gospel narratives. See, the, the one normal scholarly account within revisionist scholarship over the last hundred years is to say, to begin with, the early Christians had a private spiritual experience. Paul's conversion was an inner light rather than an objective seeing of anything or anyone. And then, according to this view, much later, towards the end of the first generation, some people came to use the word resurrection for what they, for this experience, and then on the basis of that they started telling stories about an empty tomb, and then on the basis of that some people right at the end of the first century, call them Luke and John for the sake of argument, started telling stories about a Jesus who was so solid that he could eat broiled fish and actually be touched and do things. That's the account which many have assumed is the real historical explanation of how these stories came to be. Before we look in detail at this theory, and how it's been critiqued. It is worth noting a more general point that Tom Wright raises against this theory. This is the fact that it hardly seems plausible that such subjective experiences could have generated some of the fundamental beliefs that the first Christians held. For instance, could purely subjective visions have suggested to a first century Jew that a crucified and humiliated carpenter from Nazareth was really the long-awaited Messiah 
Um, yes, the, the, the whole question as to why they said Jesus was Messiah is fascinating. We have often missed this question, I think, by taking the word Christ, the Greek Christos, as though it was a purely a proper name. And I know this is still controversial in Pauline scholarship, but it seems to me quite clear that Christos in early Christianity means Messiah. And the question is, why did they say in Acts and elsewhere, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Kyrios Kai Christos, Lord and Messiah? And it's very clear from such Jewish texts as we have, which deal with messiahship, what they expected a messiah to do. A messiah had to defeat the pagans, to rebuild the temple, to rescue Israel, and to bring, in some measure, God's judgment and justice to the whole world. Look at Isaiah, look at the Psalms, the great messianic texts are all talking about this kind of thing, and the second temple messianic texts, as in Qumran, as in Psalms of Solomon, and some of the later rabbinic references as well. Now, it's blindingly obvious Jesus hadn't done any of those things. Um, on the contrary, he had a rather ineffectual demonstration in the temple, so it seemed. He'd been executed by the occupying authorities, and Roman injustice, as they would have seen it, still was ruling the world. So how could they say Jesus was Messiah? And of course, this is the Jewish objection from that day to this. They all said, God has reversed the verdict of the Jewish court and the verdict of Pilate's court. You know, he's crucified with king of the Jews above his head. And they say, actually, the resurrection has demonstrated that, that was true and not just a mockery. Now, if you then say that the resurrection of Jesus was that Jesus went gloriously to heaven after his death, or that the disciples had a new experience of feeling forgiven or something, well, they would never, ever have said, he's been raised from the dead and he's Messiah. They would have said he's a great martyr. They would have said he's a leader whose teachings we revere, but it's simply stepping outside the bounds of historical possibility altogether to say they would have said that he was Messiah if that was all that had happened to them. With the help of a little historical imagination, Tom Wright illustrates the point that for first century Jews, subjective experiences are not going to resurrect their hope in a failed messiah. I'm fascinated by this because I discover that most um, Christians today are quite unfamiliar with the stories in Josephus and it would be a tonic for people's understanding of the New Testament if they would actually go and read the Jewish Antiquities or the Jewish War or whatever and just think into how people thought at the time. Because, for instance, Ju Josephus gives us this very graphic and horrendous account, not only of the Jewish War from 66 to 70, but of Titus's triumph back in Rome. And uh, this time last year I actually stood in the Forum in Rome and imagined the great procession of Titus's triumph because uh, at one end of the Forum up on the hill you've got Titus's arch with those haunting carvings of the Jews being led in procession, carrying the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick and so on. Um, uh, and we can see there in bas-relief to this day what that triumphal procession looked like. Now we know that the standard thing they did at the end of processions uh, triumphal processions, was to take the enemy king and he would be at the back of the procession and everyone would be jeering and cheering and throwing rotten tomatoes at him and all the rest of it. At the end of the procession they would flog him, humiliate him and kill him. And Josephus says that's exactly what happened to the man that they regarded as king of the Jews, namely Simon Bargiora. Now it's fascinating to imagine, supposing there were, let's say, 11 followers of Simon Bargiora who had somehow managed to escape being killed themselves. It would be unlikely, but supposing there were. Supposing they hide up for two or three days, and supposing then some women who are friends of theirs come and say, I think Simon's alive again, I've seen him again. We know exactly what they say, you know, for goodness sake. They got him, they lynched him, they did what the Romans always do, game over, keep your head down, maybe we'll escape with our lives. And supposing then some of the men themselves started to say, you know, I actually think he, maybe he really was the Messiah. The others would say, of course he isn't. You know, what are you dreaming of? If you want to follow a Messiah, you'll have to find another one. But don't say he's the Messiah. And then supposing they said, and I'm imagining from what, say, Skillebakes says, the disciples said, um, no, I, I feel that God has forgiven us for abandoning him and running away. I feel a new sense of conversion coming upon me. I feel that I'm becoming a different person. Now, then the friends would say, 
um, if they were feeling generous, they would say, well, that, that's wonderful, I'm very glad you're having this tremendous experience. But, you know, after all, that's what Psalm 51 is about. That's what we, we've got prayers that are about that sort of thing. But that's nothing whatever to do with A, him being raised from the dead, or B, him being Messiah. So, you see, it doesn't take much historical imagination just to say, sorry, this is not on the map.